And I would like to invite uh, for this uh, Professor Anthony Finkelstein and Alistair Bunko, who are going to talk to us, uh, as Olivier mentioned earlier, about well, whether the UK is prepared for a cyber attack. It looks like we haven't suffered from a cyber attack since Olivier mentioned this. Uh, although, <laughs> saying that, there's always cyber attacks. But how bad are they and how ready are we? You can choose where you want. Well, there are more microphones here, so why don't we go? There you go. You can be uh, amplified. All right. I think I will, yeah. There we go. So you've got 40 minutes, and I will be tough on time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, let me first you introduce you to uh, Professor Anthony Finkelstein. He's the visiting professor at Imperial College London and at the National Institute of Informatics in Tokyo. His research is based at the Alan Turing Institute, and he holds a chair <coughs> in Software Systems Engineering at University College London. He is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, an elected member of Academy, Academia Europea, and a fellow of the City and Guilds of London Institute. In 2015, he was appointed the government's chief scientific advisor for national security. Uh, my name is Alistair Bunkel. I've got the Duke of Edinburgh bronze, three <laughs> A-levels. <laughs> but I'm the defense correspondent for Sky News, which is kind of what brings me here today. Um, Professor Finkelstein, Anthony, um, describe first to me what the, your hat as the chief scientific advisor for the UK government involves. Okay, so chief scientific advisors um, really have three, have three roles. We are, um, uh, we operate research and science programs across government. We provide a critical challenge within government. So my job is to spring up at various points in, in strategic and policy discussions and shout data and evidence and experiment very loudly uh, and occasionally get listened to. Um, and the third is to operate as part of a network of chief scientific advisors across, uh, across government providing um, scientific input to some of the important problems that cross-cut different areas of, of policy and governmental responsibility. And what are some of the main problems and challenges that the government faces in 2016? Well, with respect to my specific um, uh, areas of responsibility, in, um, in, secure, in security, the major themes are picked out in the Strategic Defense and Security Review, the, um, um, the SDSR. Um, they are um, uh, countering terrorism, um, uh, securing strategic advantage for the UK by getting foresight on uh, our, um, uh, on potential adversaries and understanding the risks that are posed for our security and national prosperity. Um, and the third is um, ensuring that um, we are collectively safe to operate in the cyber domain, which I guess is the scope of the discussion today. Well, let's, let's pick out some of those themes. Um, you know, con the contemporary example of the US elections, uh, the accusations that there was uh, interference from outside in the democratic process, uh, today, I, I wrote down a tweet from um, Julian King, who's the EU Commissioner on Security, uh, former British ambassador in Paris, saying, it is safe to assume hybrid threats and attacks will continue to be used to try and influence elections in Europe in 2017. I mean, this does seem to be a growing theme, and I would have thought a pretty worrying theme, the idea that outsiders are trying to influence a political and democratic process. Yeah, so I think one of the things I think we've woken up to um, uh, perhaps as the outcome of recent events in the United, in the United States, is a realization that our democratic processes are in some senses part of our critical national infrastructure. They are actually um, uh, uh, something we need to factor in uh, protection, uh, protection for. And perhaps that realization was not um, uh, um, was not a, uh, was not a strong. You the the, um, the quote also alludes to the question about um, about hybrid uh, effect, um, effects uh, and our I think we're increasingly growing in an understanding that um, uh, cyber 
may be one dimension of a number of ways in which people seek to have influence um, uh, over, over us and needs to be placed within that broader frame. I mean, it's one thing trying to protect against a specific attack or a specific threat. It's quite something else trying to counter uh, a foreign narrative that's trying to influence opinion, uh, a sort of a sense of propaganda, if you like. I mean, how do you go about trying to counter that? Okay, so what I would say is that um, uh, this is an area in which, you know, coordinated... Um, uh, action across government is uh, um, is requ um, uh, is required, and to purely understand these things in it, in within a um, uh, purely as technological is perhaps to mis is perhaps to mis is perhaps to misunderstand. Can I move on to um, the private sector? Uh, sorry, no, I'll stay on the state sector a second. We'll move on to the private sector. But um, I just want to, you know, abuse my position, Sky and use up on here, to draw attention to a report that we had yesterday, a colleague of mine, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, um, showing that seven NHS trusts in this country don't spend anything on cybersecurity. Uh, a great deal more, 40-odd, don't even know how much they spend on cybersecurity. I mean, that sounds incredibly worrying, and that's coming from a sort of... Uh, de facto government body in the NHS. I mean, what are your thoughts on those statistics? Okay, well, I'm, uh, um, I should say, um, uh, among the various um, um, uh, pieces of, um, of puffery you managed to extract about me, um, the, that I'm also um, on, on the board of an NHS uh, hospital. Uh, so it's something I feel about when this is a failure of governance responsibility, a failure of governance responsibility um, uh, um, by the uh, um, by the um, by the boards of those uh, uh, of those bits of the N uh, uh, NHS, and they ought to be held to account. I don't want to put that. too much. And, and sound audit processes ought to have caught that, ought to have alerted uh, alerted to that and ensured the problem was rectified. But what does it tell us about the approach to cybersecurity more widely, more broadly? Because, I mean, if, if the boards of these hospitals are not sitting there and thinking we need to at least spend something, um, I mean, that, that, is more, that is a more worrying state of mind, is it not? I think, um, you know, I think what it tells us is what I guess we, uh, um, um, you know, collectively in this room we might know, which is that, you know, the, that skills are low, that understanding is not what we would wish it, uh, uh, is not what we would wish it to be, and that actually, um, uh, that is particularly true in the strategic direction, um, at the levels of strategy, at the levels of strategy, um, where the critical decision making is to take place, and that has to be addressed. How much harder does it make your job or the government's job pushing cybersecurity and the need for very tight, rigorous cybersecurity if state institutions like hospitals aren't even putting their way? Well, I think the um, – we will not get into a semantic debate about what's a state institution. Um, but um, I think that, you know, it is essential that – all large organisations pay attention, uh, pay attention to this matter, and I said I, I would regard it as a, a governance process failing if they were not um, um, if they were not to do so. Central to the um, uh, um, to the um, new national cyber strategy is in fact the question of skills and understanding and communicate uh, communication, rightfully centre. Of that, and um, uh, if if the current arrangements are ineffective, they will have to be strengthened. I suppose the theme I'm going on is one of one of messaging, and how hard it is to spread the message. I mean, in my so in my in, in my job, the sort of traditional warfare is is quite easy to sometimes illustrate if you're putting together a TV news report or you're writing column for a paper. 
Um, you can go and look at a NATO exercise on the plains of Eastern Europe. You can, uh, you know, you can take pictures of, of a bombing campaign in Iraq and Syria ongoing at the moment. When it comes to the cyber world, as in, you know, as, as vitally as important as it is, it's it's a hard one always for us to pictorially uh, cover. And I wonder whether you find you have faced similar challenges in trying to get the messaging across and trying to drive uh, okay. that important message. Well, uh, I mean, aside. A side observation first, which is that um, I actually think that um, um, that maybe the communication messages round uh, um, uh, uh, round cybersecurity more broadly have focused too much on uh, the sky is falling in, and um, uh, I'm not quite sure whether that discourse at this stage in maturity is indeed the right way to structure, communi um, structure communications. That's the first thing. The second thing to say is that um, the creation of the um, National Cyber Security Center means that there is a, a, um, uh, a trusted body well positioned to provide both advice and, asse um, both advice and assessment uh, and that, that this brings together key elements, um, uh, the, you know, key contributory elements of, of the overall um, environment, which I think is a positive step forward. I mean, do you, to, to pick up on that, and do you think that for too long cybersecurity has been a little bit too covert? So it's been the work of GCHQ uh, and other government partners. If companies have suffered major security attacks, often they will try and keep it quiet for fear of reputational damage, and it's been going on sort of behind the scenes, and your average Joe has been unaware of. I think there's a situational calculation to be made about when it is best, I mean, this is a, 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 a subject of a considerable body of thinking, about when uh, um, it is best to disclose problems and vulnerabilities and when it is best um, uh, to retain that knowledge in such a way as to allow people to make the necessary security procedures and get those things in place. And that is a, um, um, that is a calculation that has to be made relative to the specific, relative to the specific, con relative to the specific context. Um, more broad, you know, more broadly, I think the um, uh, the, you need to be able to make quite sure that advice and assessment are together in the right, you know, are, are properly aligned and that's I think what, what steps have been taken now. The, I think we should also say that you know, the government has invested a very large amount of money in cyber security and in a whole series of different measures, the creation of NCSC, a significant body of funding um, out to the research community and so on and so forth. And it has done that because of the, realisa because the realization that we in some senses have a, had a little bit of a structural failure and that, um, uh, that Private industry needs to work in some much cl more closely in partnership um, with go uh, with government, and that government has a role in actually uh, promoting the necessary structural arrangements. I think so it's basically a diagnosis of a bit of a market failure, and I think the arrangements reflect new arrangements reflect that. So. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I often see it as a bit of a triangle. You have, um, which is a so, so, so unlike other aspects of national security. You've got, on one point, the intelligence agencies, specifically GCHQ and government. Then you've also got uh, private companies, major private companies, whose cybersecurity matters greatly to the overall security of the state. Um, and, you know, banks... Um, Etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got the individual as well, and we are, as individuals, becoming um, increasingly exposed to cyber threats through our 
yes. increasing use of technology. How do you marry those three all together? Um, and, and that's a very good question, and I'm not sure that we that we entirely have that that we entirely have that right. But before I make some suggestions on in that regard, I might point that I said I think that we're, we've reached a point where um, you know hitherto the notion of critical infrastructure of critical infrastructure has been relatively narrowly drawn, and I think there is a growing realization that the notion of critical national infrastructure needs to be more widely needs to be more widely drawn because um, uh, of the basic interconnectedness of so much of what we want of so much of what we want to do so there are there are bits of um, uh, there are things there are you know companies functions for example in the finance sector and otherwise where you might have gone hitherto I'm not sure that's critical. You know, we need to think more about you know energy and uh, uh, um, and transport and a restricted set. And I think now we're expanding that notion. So I don't know what that does to the triangle. Sort of alters a few of the vertices, but it, it, it's okay. Um, the uh, what we need now is, in terms of the individuals, we need tailored um, advice. For each of the uh, for each of the component, each of the different audiences for security mess for security messaging, um, and um, that advice, uh, and we need to have uh, and we need to have a coordinated systemic sense of what affects the way that people will work and live. Should there be more carrot and stick? And I was thinking of sort of talk talk. Uh, had a data breach and 157,000 customers' data was at risk, and I think they got fined something like £40,000. Um, Tesco only recently, um, eight, OBT, uh, 8 million in 2014, that's true. Um, I just wonder whether or not um, enough pressure is being put on, on these companies. Can you ever get total security, or do we need to accept nowadays that... Uh, there is going to always be an element of, of breach. Well, I don't think that anybody, um, uh, um, I don't think any security professional ever thinks about total um, uh, about total security. I think the the common view is that um, uh, that security is an economic is an economic issue, and what you have to do ultimately is to so ratchet up um, uh, the cost. For a potential, um, uh, for a potential a um, uh, uh, attacker, um, that this uh, um, this cost outweighs any potential benefit that they might um, uh, that they might gain, and that they must align resources accordingly. That's a purely economic issue. I mean, economic writ large, not just about how much you uh, uh, might find talk talk um, I want to much though I would like talk talk to suffer you know, <laughs> I just want to say <laughs> this is um, um, I, I can tell you about my mother-in-law's phones my mother died sounds like you want to get something off your back I, I really do sure. <laughs> But I won't, I won't. Um, We'll open it up for questions in just a second. Uh, so if you've got any questions about anything or talk talk, just one, one. But I've just covered two of those 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 points on the triangle that I um, outlined. I just want to quickly ask you about the third, and that is the, the individual, if you like. We pretty much all now carry around um, smartphones. We're all connected one way or the other to the internet uh, through a multitude of devices. Um, do you think that these devices have become almost too complicated. We receive updates from people like Apple, uh, it seems, every couple of weeks. Can you ever envisage a time when, uh, for greater security, actually things like mobile phones become more simple again? Mm, actually, no, is the answer. <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, so, I mean, this, this may, be, may be worthwhile making a point which I recognize will be is idiosyncratic and slightly controversial which is that uh, I'm basically a security optimist. 
So I believe that um, uh, we, are, we are now within a window where we are facing, um, uh, you, know, a, you know, maybe a, a rising a significant problem with software and system vulnerabilities. But my, my firmly held belief is that actually um, we have the makings technologically of addressing much of this. So I believe that um, uh, better development practice, I believe that formal verification, I actually believe the use of big data and machine learning in, um, as for example exemplified by the DARPA grand challenges, I believe many of these things are actually on the way to addressing the, bulk, uh, um, um, the largest component of the vulnerability problems that we, um, uh, that we face. So actually I think that um, uh, we're in a bit of an odd, an odd, an odd time, but I do actually um, think that um, many of the things like, for example, Internet of Things devices, which are currently, um, you know, offer a significant vulnerability surface, I, I think that that problem will close, will close. And I think that ultimately it will become a, a bit of an arms, a, a bit of a resource race, uh, as with encryption. Uh, um, and then I think the good guys have the beating. Okay, that is optimistic. Right, enough of me, not enough of Anthony. Um, yes, sir. I think there are microphones, aren't there, going around, so there's one coming just behind you. Um, thank you, that was most illuminating and very helpful. Uh, Malcolm Wall from the Federation of Small Businesses. You hinted at it, you mentioned individuals, and you mentioned large corporates, and you mentioned governments. Uh, we do struggle in the small business empires to understand what we, how we play our part, as it were. I wondered what views you have for the future as to how small business can improve our resilience. Okay, so um, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting, que uh, it's a very interesting question. I think that, um, uh, one element of that question is the question about skills and about ensuring that um, uh, actually the whole of the business marketplace has access to the sort of skills that are necessary to provide security um, uh, um, for business. I think the next is to make quite sure that um, uh, the core services that smaller businesses have access to um, have the, the type of security that is um, um, uh, um, that is nece that is necessary. I think the I think the last observation is um, a little bit about that. My sus I don't know whether it's suspicion or it's an analysis. I have this view that um, uh, you know that. What we're likely to see as the result of security problems are systems failures, which may be cut across some of these the, the, the neat delineations that a, that a triangle in, uh, uh, that a triangle implies. Um, so it may well be the the things about small businesses in connection with consumers, in connection with their larger service providers. That the, that the issues might cut across. And how we address that, I don't know. So it's a bit rambling, but... My triangle's becoming a theme. Uh, you uh, so th uh, friend, so uh, thank you very much. I found that uh, very interesting. So there's a, a couple of things I would pick up on. The talk talk issue. The day they had their cyber breach, their share price went through the floor. So they did inherently have a cost associated with not looking after their customer base. And since that cyber breach, a number of their customers have moved elsewhere. So the, built into the system, there's a financial model. That is not to excuse them. It is simply because the vulnerability was well known. They were advised about it well in advance, and they didn't do anything to fix it. But that sort of follows on from the earlier point that many industries don't actually know how to address uh, their cyber problems. You were touching on, Alistair, about how many updates we get to smartphones. The reason we get updates is because the operating system is inherently vulnerable, and so they're having to update to try and make the device secure. We were talking about Internet of Things earlier. 
the device as well has an easy password because people are trying to sell as many smart devices into the home. And so the attacks going forward are more likely to originate within country where the smart kettle, the smart TV, the smart device has been captured by the bad guys who are very smart and then will launch an attack. So I think it's a very much a matter of trying to educate people. Uh, banning people from taking their smartphones to work. Now that would be one way of trying to make the workplace secure because inherently, you're, this is a Trojan horse, you take it to the workplace, your, your company network is potentially vulnerable. So there's a trade-off between making it easy for applications for, and for users to use applications, but you're also making it easy for the bad guys to compromise your device and use it as an attack vector. So, so I think my, my earlier observation, which is that I'm not sure, and maybe it, it, it does uh, actually reinforce the, uh, um, um, the point made, which is that uh, about carrots and sticks, um, which is that I'm not sure that at the moment the market works. If you'd have thought, you'd have thought, wouldn't you, that um, this precise example where the share price falls and people realize, businesses realize they need to um, uh, make uh, the necessary changes because the economic imperative drives them in that, in that, um, that direction. It's a true observation, um, but I'm not sure that anymore I have confidence that it operates with the force that is necessary. Now, that's not an argument um, um, for fines or regulation, but it certainly is an, an argument um, uh, um, for government to be very engaged with the issue about um, uh, education, communication, advice, and a whole range of um, and a whole range of things like uh, a whole range of things like that. Um, yes, we're getting updates on on mobile phones and so on. The um, uh, but just as we're getting runtime updates, it seems to me conceivable, and uh, maybe greater experts in the room than me, that we will increasingly see runtime verification so that actually we will be able to determine whether things are safe on insta, you know, on, in, uh, uh, on installation. Um, and I think that will increasingly give some, increasingly give some confidence. The last point is that, um, you know, again, a message maybe of optimi uh, uh, a bit of optimism is the possibility of understanding much better the whole question about what you can safely compute in an environment where you cannot trust the other components. And I think we're making progress on that. So, very interesting question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thanks, sir. Patricia Lewis from Chatham House. Um, the Internet of Things, um, which we want to rename. We have two contenders at the moment. One is Gadgenet, <laughs> and the other is Gizmonet, which I quite like. Um, I, I just wanted to bring to your attention um, a debate that we're having at Chatham House. We've begun a series of discussions on the Internet of Things and cybersecurity. And it's the issue of the insurance industry and standards versus guidelines and the role of the insurance industry in that debate. And it would be really good, I think, to have a bit of a discussion about the whole issue of security by design, needing to retrofit a lot of the so-called Internet of Things, and how we might drive some of that through insurance standards earlier rather than later. Hmm. So I think uh, um, um, I want to to comment on the two dimensions that first just make an, an observation about the internet um, about the internet of things um, the internet of things does bring with it um, just trying to think what the best way to, to, to start this uh, um, in I, I think there's some very interesting questions raised by the internet of things that actually also lie beyond the, um, the question of, cl of classical software vulnerabilities, where security is mostly located. I think the whole question about the, um, uh, about the electromagnetic environment, about the physics of computation, and, um, uh, and about physical access to, devi um, um, to devices. And there's a whole very interesting space which is underexplored around that technically. 
So I think there's a lot more work to be done on, uh, um, uh, on that. Um, the second um, thing, thing about the insurance question. Um, now I'm going to I'm going to get a bit geeky, um, which is that okay, security is in inverted commas non-compositional property. In other words, you can put one system that has been independently shown to be secure in combination with another system that has independently been shown to be secure. And the two systems in combination are insecure, right? In other words, the property, that the, the mathematical properties of security across a system are very complex. And at the moment, I'm not sure that we know how to build a market in, those, in that situation, in that situation. Um, because actually, the maths of failure don't work like other types of system. So I, I think there's a re so there may be quite fundamental reasons why the insurance market isn't isn't there because you can't so easily predict in the probability distributions of failure. We've got about probably just under ten minutes. So this gentleman down here, could you, and then this gentleman, and then we'll go to the back. <coughs> Christian Laranaga, um, wearing my own hat for a moment. Um, the last answer very actually almost directly started to attach what the question I have, which is really to do with your title as Chief Scientific Advisor for National Security. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not being glib, but it, it, it touches exactly on the issue of science and national security. Are you finding our national security is scientific? And do we need to be looking much more deeply into the aspects of how do we construct a science around these issues to give us some rules-based data collection, um, measurement, a whole range of issues? Uh, is, there, is, there some, is there some kind of structured role you see that's progressing in the future? Or is it, are we going to stay with the sort of cybersecurity silo type uh, thing we have at the moment? Uh, two observations. The first is that um, increasingly, government is becoming much more aware, more generally, about the importance of science and evidence um, informing policy and operate uh, informing policy and operations. Um, actually, the UK government has astonishingly capable um, uh, um, scientific, uh, you know, astonishingly capable scientific uh, uh, um, cadre, and um, uh, you know. You may well say that in the area of in the area of certainly computing security, um, this is an area where the UK has had leading expertise within um, leading expertise within government. So that's the um, um, uh, that's the broader uh, um, the broader question. Of course, there's much more. Of course, there's much more to um, uh, much more to do in the national security um, uh, Set, um, uh, setting. There is the advantage that um, most people who work in, in national security and government are people for whom evidence um, is a very strong part of their driver and um, um, whom um, distrust um, in, um, uh, in things that are just said is very high. Um, and um, that's good for a scientific advisor. Okay, we've got five more minutes. Uh, two more questions. Uh, gentleman at the front here, waiting for some time, and then we'll finally go to the back left there. Thank you, Professor Finkelstein. Question really that's been muted earlier by a speaker. Uh, having worked, I declare an interest for Shell with their data collection and for NATO with its um, many years ago. Is it the case that you think we'll ever see the likes of Facebook managed to the same extent the likes of GCHQ are? specifically with their targeting abilities using big data. And one of the arguments that's going on today is the fact that the way that Facebook selects its news for you to read, which is an active input into your mind, um, isn't being particularly governed. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really that well equipped to speak about Facebook individually as a, um, um, as a, um, as a company. What I, would, um, what I would observe 
is that um, they are actually one of the leading contributors to work on um, uh, to work on the development of uh, provably secure um, uh, software. So they have a, a, a good corporate reputation for their work in that uh, for their work in that regard. I'm not sure I'm well placed to comment on the on on the broader question of data analysis. Thank you very much, and that was in the context of a reliable source, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and just finally, at the back, sir. Uh, this won't take very long. I'm Roland Perry from the Digital Trust. I'm a geek who understands marketing. Um, it's always important to give things a good name, and then you get traction for your um, uh, your project and, and, and your aspirations. So things like Snoopers Chart are caught on, whether it's true or not, doesn't matter, but it made people think about it and they recognized it. So I suggest we need to call um, this, this stuff the insecurity of things, if you want a collective now. <laughs> Oh, well, lots of interesting marketing advi uh, uh, advice, I mean, the insecurity of gizmo nets, or we could uh, combine the two benefits. Well, there you joke. I mean, it picks up on the it picks up on the topic we were talking about earlier, actually, about getting the message across and actually spreading it from people yeah. who sort of understand what they're talking about in rooms like this into the sort of the wider populace and um, everybody who carries these. Now, look, um, just to finish with the um, the title of this talk was "Is the UK prepared for a cyber security attack?" Um, so I'll just ask you very simply, is the UK prepared for a cyber attack? <laughs> the UK takes, um, uh, uh, takes a, great pays gr a great deal attention of attention to that risk. It has invested very significantly both in the long term and in the short term um, uh, in the short term res uh, in the short term response. It exercises its capability it exercises its capability regular uh, um, um, regularly and tries to learn and um, learn and improve. I think we are um, uh, we are amongst um, uh, the leading states in the world in this um, um, in this um, in this regard. There's always the more. this is a risk business. Nobody is ever going to tell you that there um, um, uh, that that it isn't um, that it isn't. But yes, broadly yes. Professor Anthony Finkelsteiner, cybersecurity optimist, but fascinating as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>